welcome to the Ray Harryhausen podcast, the show dedicated to the life, career and films of a special effects titan. Join us as we host in-depth discussions about the work, influences and legacies of this uniquely talented filmmaker. Brought to you by the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation, we will be delving into Ray's archive to bring a unique insight into his work, including exclusive audio from the man himself. We will be joined by special guests for retrospectives, exclusive announcements and competitions, so this podcast is a must-listen for all fans of the world of Ray Harryhausen, animation and classic filmmaking. Hello and welcome to episode 15 of the Ray Harryhausen podcast and welcome to our 60th anniversary celebration of 20 Million Miles to Earth. Uh, The film was released in 1957 and today we're going to be exploring a little bit of the the movie's history and its production but also its legacy and I'm joined once more by Foundation Trustee John Walsh. John, how are you looking forward to exploring and celebrating such a landmark film for Ray Harryhausen? Hi Connor, yes, episode 15. Gosh, we got here quickly, didn't we? Um, It's it's going to be an exciting one. It's a personal favourite of mine of the... uh, if we can call it the sci-fi trilogy that he did in black and white for Columbia Pictures, um, and the final of the three. Um, I, I call it a trilogy, of course, they're not linked, other than the fact that they were shot in black and white, shot quite quickly, and each have a, a very distinctive sci-fi um, storyline that really suits the sort of the, the late 50s uh, paranoia, with all things coming into the country, invading things and changing people. That's right, and this one, I think... 20 million miles to earth as well as being the end of an era in some ways being the last of that trilogy it, there's also hints towards what ray might do in the future you know the, you can see elements of his work and his creations that would go on to appear in later movies and of course that was a very interesting story because ray developed the the plot of the film himself he he wrote the original uh, screenplay and developed the the creature the Emir is a completely unique creation. It's not something that had, uh, had come from any kind of previous uh, influences. So again, you can really see a sense of Ray stretching his artistic capabilities and, and looking towards what the potential of stop motion animation was. Absolutely. Now, before you get into a, a plot summary, um, just to let our listeners know, we've got some other interesting um, program items coming up. We're going to have a chat about some of our exhibitions and some developments for us here at the Ray Harryhausen podcast. So uh, before we get on to all of that, though, it's our 20 million miles special, 60th. So, Connor, if you'd like to uh, do the honours with the, the plot summary. A US rocket ship crashes in the sea off the coast of Sicily on its return to Earth from a mission to the planet Venus. A group of local fishermen rescue one astronaut, played by William Hopper, and also a jelly-like specimen from the sinking hull. From the jelly, a creature, or emir, is born, witnessed by a professor and a visiting doctor, played by Joan Taylor. Earth's atmosphere somehow enables the emir to grow to an enormous size, and after terrorising Sicily, it is anaesthetised by electricity and taken to Rome Zoo to be studied. Following an accident, the emir is brought back to consciousness, after which it battles with an elephant and wreaks havoc on the city. Finally, it meets its end atop the Colosseum. So, John, quite a quite a simple puck, straightforward, and uh, it jumps right into the action. This film, from the, from the off, you've got a rocket crash, you've got astronauts being rescued, and it's very efficient storytelling. Um, the thing that strikes me most about Twenty Million Miles to Earth is just how vulnerable the Emir is, and to me, it's uh, the perfect example of how Ray would act through his animations. He wasn't just a technician. He was really expressing himself in a way through his models because the Emir from the from the get-go is such a sympathetic creature. Absolutely. No, so we talked earlier that this was the third in the Columbia trilogy of the sci-fi films. So um, we finish with, with this in 1957. The previous year, it was Earth versus the Flying Saucers in 56, and it came from beneath the sea, the, the sixth tentacled octopus attacking the uh, San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge in 1955. So to pick up on your point about characterization, the the octopus... Um, was very much a set performance piece of a special effects spectacular, but there was no sense of, um, if you like, character or sympathy with what was a, effectively a monster attacking from the sea. Also with Earth versus the Flying Saucers, there was some, some fantastic aerial acrobatics with the 
um, the flying saucers and some wonderful special effects, but again, no characterization. So this is the first of the black and white films um, of this trilogy. Of course, Beast from 20,000 Fathoms had its own kind of characterization. But here with the stance of the creature, um, with the whipping tail, we, we can identify some of the motifs that um, are are pretty much Ray Harryhausen trademarks in inverted commas. Um, the stance of the creature when he's when he's watching, the the elbows pushed backwards, the head sort of cocking to left and right, um, and as you say, there there is that certain sympathy element that you might find perhaps in King Kong, although I will say that this is a much more accomplished animation performance than King Kong, and the Emir itself has become one of the iconic creatures of the Harryhausen legacy. So when Connor, we had our competition there um, 18 months ago for um, Harryhausen 100. Then we found that the Emir popped up quite regularly, even though it's quite an early film and it's black and white, although it has been colourised more on that later. But it sits nicely in the trilogy because it shows that sense of development from octopus to flying saucers to this, as you rightly say, character performance. And there's lots of interaction, isn't there? Because right from the get-go, when he, he hatches from that sort of gel egg, um, there's lots of human interaction, eye contact, isn't there? Yes, absolutely. And there's lots of, I suppose, reaction shots. We have the, the baby Emir emerging and then rubbing his eyes. And you, you can't help but feel sorry for it. But of course, you have the, the professor character and his, and his niece in the background watching the creature and there is lots of um, interaction from the start as the emir begins to grow and reach its human size of course there's a there's a bit of a battle between uh, this uh, this poor lost creature and the the civilians on earth who seem to be set on tormenting the poor beast throughout the film and there's lots of clever ideas lots of really interesting ways in which ray explored the, the character of the emir of course when you see the creature taking refuge in a farm, in a shed. He walks past livestock, he walks past sheep and lambs, has no intention of harming any other creature. He's just looking for sulphur, I think, is, is his main source of food. And he seems to be getting attacked from all angles and eventually is forced to retaliate after being attacked by a dog. So just the way that this was thought out was quite different. And you mentioned King Kong. Um, there's obviously huge elements of King Kong, which was Ray Harryhausen's favourite film, but even King Kong was um, was quite antagonistic. He'd be attacking dinosaurs or attacking villagers. The poor Emir is really just uh, going about his business and is being attacked purely because he exists, because he's been kidnapped from his home planet. And uh, I think the way that Ray characterised this, it puts you firmly on the side of the creature. The, the human heroes, in inverted commas, uh, don't really have your support in this film. No, exactly. And, uh, and, and as another sort of departure... Um, it's not filming in America, so it's filming in um, in and around Sicily and Rome. And uh, of course, the talk was that Ray wanted a vacation. I mean, Ray, Ray never thought in terms of I know, let's get a free holiday out of this. You know, he very much thought that it it, it was a much more romantic setting. Um, when you look at Ray's production drawings, which we still have in the archive, you can see that sense of architecture and how the Emir, who is a quite beautiful and graceful creature, sits nicely into the, the settings of the Trevi Fountain and, and, and that sort of backdrop. Um, but what's the um, foundation position at the moment, Connor, in terms of assets from, from 20 million miles to Earth? What, what have we got? And more importantly, what haven't we got? Well, sadly, it is one of our films that is uh, kind of least represented within the collection for, for reasons which I'll explain just now. We do have the resin skull of the Emir, the original Emir model, um, still very powerful piece of course despite the fact that it's uh, it's really a, a shell of its former self and from the film we have the lamppost which the emir tears which he bends while he's on his rampage in Rome um, of course as with all of these films we have scores of key drawings and sketches and storyboards and for this creature in particular it's very interesting because Ray was developing the idea very early on of what kind of what kind of creature would be most sympathetic but also most fantastic. So the Emir started out as a kind of cyclops, quite a large creature reminiscent of the cyclops from the seventh voyage of Sinbad, which would uh, which would appear in the next film. So the Emir went through a lot of design stages and we've got some fantastic sketches from Ray where he was just letting his imagination run wild. You can really tell some of some of the creatures are very uh, alien and otherworldly. Others look 
very similar to to previous creatures and he was really putting together that perfect blend of a, a creature that would be alien and yet relatable and we'll be certain to post some of these fantastic sketches onto our, our Facebook and Twitter feeds in the coming weeks. Um, I mentioned the Cyclops and one of the reasons that we don't have the full Emir model is because for the next film, Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, Ray was forced to cam- cannibalise the poor Emir model for his armature parts and a lot of these pieces went into the Cyclops model which was in the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. So that's probably why we don't have the original model. However, we do have exact replicas which were created from the original moulds uh, which again are still within the collection. And you see these replicas. Uh, Ray made one for his good friend Forry Ackerman. So you've got a, we've got a great picture of the two of them together with the Emir replica. And within the collection now we have this fantastic Emir model as a, as a testimony to the original from 1957 and, and a lasting tribute. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. I've I've seen that picture with Forry and Ray holding the Emir and it's tantalising because it makes you think, oh, perhaps there was a second Emir and perhaps it was part of uh, Forry's collection and the Acker Mansion of of um, of pieces. But uh, sadly, it wasn't the case. And, and when it was cannibalised, it was simply for budgetary and scheduling reasons, wasn't it? Because to recreate a similar armature when you've got one sat there um, would have not only cost... Um, dollars and cents but of course would have cost vital animation time so if you were to be in that mindset in the late 50s it was the right thing to do and think of us as a society we're regularly reusing and reapplicating things and repurposing things all the time so it's um it's no criticism of ray or his legacy that he didn't hold on to the emir but if i did have a time machine and i stopped off i would ask him to to think twice um, because the Emir becoming so iconic and facially I've always thought this and I'm sure lots of other people do in Ray's final film uh, Clash of the Titans the face and stance of the Kraken um, is very heavily influenced isn't it uh, Connor from from the Emir you can you can see the, um, the 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 evolution the creature evolution there yeah I think I think you're right I think this was a uh maybe one of Ray's final ways of paying tribute to to the original Emir model, uh, a film which was created 25 years later, Clash of the Titans. The the jowls and the stance and the the facial expression on the Kraken are very similar. Uh, Also in the the Golden Voyage of Sinbad, the homunculus scene, I think, is is evocative of the, the birth of the Emir. Again, this very small, vulnerable creature, which is really being manipulated. It's not, it's not an evil creature in itself again harks back to this this theme that the emir started um going back to your your comments about the armature of course uh, another point uh, to make about that is that the armatures on these early films were all created by Ray's father Frederick Harryhausen and so of course there's aside from budgetary reasons like, as you say it's the time and the money and asking your father to create basically an identical armature to the one he'd made a year previously is it's more of a, an issue of practicality and I'm sure Ray would have loved to have kept the Emir. The Cyclops demanded these body parts. Now, shortly we'll hear a clip from Ray chatting from the the wonderful Ray Harryhausen special effects Titan, where he's going to talk about um, 20 million miles to Earth. And that brilliant film is available um, through Arrow Video as um, a Blu-ray and a DVD. And it's available now in the United States as well as a Region A, you lucky people. But um, before we we finish... um, with Ray having the final word on that, Connor, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about the colorization and the controversy around it, because you spoke very successfully um, at the Sydney Strange Festival when you presented a colorized premiere of the German color print of Earth versus the Flying Saucers, and it was very successful. Um, this this has also been colorized, hasn't it? That's right. In the same process by Legend Films, and the process was overseen by Ray Harryhausen himself. And this is an interesting film because this is a film, 20 Million Miles to Earth, that was originally mooted as being in colour. And Charles Schneer very much wanted this picture to to be Ray's first colour production. But ironically, at the time, Ray was quite reluctant to go in that direction because Kodak had just released a 35mm black and white stock which was perfect for stop motion animation. I mean, it, you know, the second generation uh, photography that you would mix with the live footage, you know, integrated perfectly. And Ray was very concerned that 
this wouldn't be quite as effective with colour footage. At the time, back in the, the late 1950s, he was concerned that the, the animation footage, so to speak, would just not integrate as well. So this was something that was held off until the next film. But of course the film was visualised in colour and there was discussion of the film taking place in colour. So back in 2008, Ray was able to oversee the colourisation process. And it looks fantastic. Again, I think having Ray on board adds a really authenticity. It's really from his imagination onto the onto the screen. And this year, actually, on Ray's birthday, the 29th of June, another premiere because we showcased 20 million miles to Earth in colour in Aberdeen for the first time in the UK on the big screen. And it's very interesting speaking to people. Obviously, there's a lot of fans who prefer the black and white version, but younger fans, a lot of younger fans will not watch black and white movies, at least not yet. And we get contacted quite regularly from parents of young fans, like very young fans, fans who are four or five years old, who just wouldn't be interested in watching a black and white film, but who love the colourised versions. And again, that was something that was interesting to speak about with race fans in Aberdeen. Um, it was the Granite City Comic Con who helped organise this event, and there were a lot of fans there, and I got a, a great opportunity to chat with people afterwards about what they thought about the film. And again, seeing the colour version as well as being a bit of a novelty for fans who have seen the black and white version numerous times. I think for the younger members of the audience, it allows them to, to sink their teeth into the film in a, in a far easier manner than uh, just having the black and white version alone would. So, as we said for Earth vs. the Flying Saucers, you've got both choices. You've got an upgraded, remastered, colourised version, or you've got the black and white. Both look fantastic and, and both serve serve a very unique purpose. Indeed, and both have been fully remastered. They've been scanned in 2 and in 4K by um, by Grover Crisp down at Sony Pictures, who looks after Ray's uh, legacy there for, for Columbia. Um, we'll, we'll finish off this segment of the show um, with Ray himself uh, chatting about 20 million miles to Earth. Some of you may also have heard the story of a monster now confined here in Rome Zoo. That beast is from Venus. The creature in... 20 million miles to Earth. It went through many changes. It was very stout. It had horns at one point. It had one eye at one point. Finally, I arrived at the, the humanoid torso, sort of a lizard combination with a humanoid torso, because I felt you could get much more emotion out of a humanoid type of figure rather than an animal type of figure. Venus. The planet Venus. That's great. Now, it's interesting uh, segue there because we try and bring you a piece of Ray Harryhausen for every episode and most of the Harryhausen audio that we bring you has never been heard before. It was recorded um, well, recorded by myself, so pass on the back for myself, but it was recorded when I, I sat down with Ray and did lots of commentary tracks. Uh, that particular audio, however, was from the excellent uh, Ray Harryhausen special effects Tyson made by Frenetic Arts. Um, the reason I want to, to plug ourselves at this point is that um, I'm delighted and thrilled to say that in our first year of recording, or year and a bit, um, we've been nominated for the People's Choice Podcast Awards in the film and television section. Now, you as listeners can, can log in to the podcastawards.com, find the film and television section in the drop-down menu, and if you so wish, you can vote for us and... Uh, Anyone who's interested in Ray's legacy, interested in very original podcast broadcasting, which has a, a significant oral history element, which this one does, then uh, we hope to uh, to garner your support. Um, and it's very exciting, Connor, isn't it, to get a, a a nomination of this size in our in our inaugural year? That's right, because this is the twelfth annual People's Choice Podcast Award, so it's a very long running and established podcast awards ceremony, and. What I think is interesting is the operative word here is people's choice. This is um, one I think that the, a lot of our fans are responsible for having us nominated. And since our first show, we've had lots of fascinating feedback from fans who listen to the show. And we've had lots of fan contributions and people who have even gone to the extent of recording their own reminiscences on Ray's films and sending it in to us. So really, if you've enjoyed our shows, but more specifically enjoyed listening to Ray Harryhausen's exclusive audio or listening to the interviews that we've had with people who knew Ray or who worked with Ray, or even if you've been a fan who's got in touch with the show and had your question read, or you've had 
your own recordings played on the show, then I think it's a, a wonderful indictment of what, what fantastic year we've had in, in podcasting. And uh, every vote, of course, is much appreciated. And Connor, just to remind us how we can find that. There's, there's a website, isn't there? Yes, it's at podcastawards.com. So it's quite simple to remember. You click on podcastawards.com and there's a big banner in the middle of the page where you can nominate your votes. Uh, all they ask for is an email address. You register your vote and they email you just to confirm you're a real person and then you can vote for you can vote for our podcast in the TV and film category and then have a look through the other categories too because there's lots of fantastic podcasts in there. As I say, it's a very long established award ceremony and um, it's a real thrill to be nominated. Now, um, moving along, we've um, we've been travelling, or I, I should say yourself and the uh, the collection have been travelling, and you've been to America, Connor, and you've got a fantastic interview for us. That's right. We were very excited to announce our first exhibition in the USA for many years, and that's going to be opening at the Science Museum in Oklahoma on the 29th of July. So, by the time this podcast is released, I would imagine that the, the exhibition will be open. Now, back in March, I was uh, able to, to take a trip over to, to the Science Museum and have a look at what they had in store for us. And I have to say, it's a, it's a fantastic location. What is, it's going to be a great institution for us to, to host our first exhibition in the USA for so many years. Very family-friendly place. Lots of exciting things to do. And I think what's most interesting is it's going to give you an opportunity to get quite close to raised models. You'll be able to walk around them look at them from different angles um, and admire them alongside a lot of the artwork and storyboards. So it's going to be a fantastic exhibition. And I had a chance to speak with one of the museum's directors, Scott Henderson, while I was over in Oklahoma. Uh, So let's listen to that interview now where you can find out a little bit more about Ray Harryhausen's mythical menagerie in Oklahoma. I command you to raise the wind and the sea. Destroy Argos! to make certain that no stone stands, that no creature crawls, I command you to let loose the last of the titans. Let loose the Kraken! I'm in a very exciting location because I've been scooping out the Science Museum of Oklahoma for an exhibition which will be taking place this coming summer. I'm joined by one of the museum's directors, Scott Henderson. How are you, Scott? I'm doing very well. Very well today. And we're here to discuss a really exciting exhibition that we've got lined up of Ray Harryhausen's fantasy film material from our archive. So that's models and artwork from Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, Golden Voyage of Sinbad, Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger, Jason and the Argonauts, and Clash of the Titans. So some of Ray's best known and most loved films. Uh, before we talk a little more about the exhibition, Scott, can you tell us a little bit about your history as a Ray Harryhausen fan? Well, it goes back to when I was young, um, probably at the age of, I'm going to guess, six or seven years old. Um, first movie I think I saw was Clash of the Titans, or made a big impact on me. Um, and I you never will forget all the scenes, the, the memorable scenes, especially, of course, Medusa and uh, the Kraken very memorable in my mind, and Bubo, um, but also at that age we still had movie rental stores that you could go in and pick out your VHS tape, and uh, I would always be back and forth between, you know, I had to see all the Sinbad movies, and then of course Jason the Argonauts, so the fantasy films are the ones I treasure the most, and I remember vividly as a, as a young kid, and I've re-watched them of course in the last couple of years, and uh, still, still very uh, much in love with all the films. And now you're going to be dealing with an exhibition showcasing all of these films featuring the creatures that you grew up with and who had uh, such a a huge huge influence on you. Um, I was going to try and describe the Science Museum of Oklahoma a little, but I don't think I can put into words what what I've seen over (laughs) this weekend. It's uh, it's a a phenomenal space, a very, very exciting uh, location for an exhibition to take place. Um, So much family fun but also some very informative and educational displays, alongside some more reflective exhibits as well. And what's your philosophy as a director of the museum, as somebody organising such exhibitions? Well, my philosophy or my mission um, is to incorporate and show the um, relationship between science and art and how those two um, 
they're intrinsic, um, have an intrinsic relationship with each other and are very important for one another. Sometimes people feel to realize um, the importance of art in science, and Ray is a perfect example of that. Um, the technical skills and the anatomy and the, and the science behind what he does mixed with the creative art aspect of his creatures and imagination. Um, it's a perfect example for, for our museum to showcase his work. Well, as you say, we're not going to just be um, exhibiting models. Um, that's right. Obviously, oh, yeah. the first thing that people comes to people's minds is the models, but it's going to be storyboards, sketches, key drawings, and prototype models, as well as some of armatures to, to showcase how, how Ray designed and structured his animation models. Um, so you're really going to be going quite in-depth into the gestation of these characters, as well as the final product themselves. Correct, correct. Uh, you know, Ray was an amazing illustrator and artist, um, two-dimensional artist as well. And I don't know if a lot of people realize that, so that'll be a fun um, way to showcase what was behind, what took place in his imagination before he created the creatures for the films. Um, and you can also see the comparison sketches, which I find amazing, to show the, the actual scale involved. Um, it's quite brilliant and um, I think it's, uh, it's amazing to showcase kind of these unseen things that have never been seen before by many, many people, especially here in the United States. Well, that's something that's obviously a good point because it's been some time since there's been an exhibition of Ray's work in the USA. Uh, we know how passionate Ray's fa fans are in America. Ray was obviously an American man, uh, although he lived in London for you know, the latter half of his life. He always had a, a home in the United States, and that was his, very proud of his American background. So how does it feel to have Oklahoma as the first location of our Harryhausen 100 celebrations in North America? Well, I'm very honoured, very honoured and very proud um, to be able to host this. Um, kind of in whatever my wildest dreams that I think this was going to, to happen and that it's happening now. And um, just to be able, once once the, uh, the models arrive in the artwork, it's going to be like having 10 Christmases in one, just being able to, to see these, uh, to see the actual models and be able to uh, create this amazing exhibit. Um, it's just a, it's a dream come true. And one of the exciting things from our point of view is that the way you're going to be exhibiting this work, it's not just a retrospective or a biography of Ray, it's um, really showcasing Ray's work as somebody who's influential to this day and who will continue to be an influence whose art and whose movies are going to resonate throughout future generations and you obviously have a lot of young families and, and children attending your exhibitions and it's going to be a really great chance for people who are maybe a little too young to have seen Ray's films when they originally came out to find inspiration from his fantastic work. That's correct, yes. Um, you know, there, there's something about Ray's movies um, and his his uh, animation and the creatures involved that there's a very uh, human touch to it and no matter what age, even kids that have seen all the CGI movies of today, um, have never really seen anything like like what Ray's done. Um, the media grabs their attention and they, they fall in love with it. I noticed that firsthand with my own daughter, who's nine years old. Um, but it's also going to be uh, very fun and informative to show the new generations um, what led up to the movies they see today and how these probably wouldn't exist without Ray's work and give them a sense of um, the dedication and time um, that it takes to make something of quality, you know. Um, so it will be an educational exhibit as well. And we'll, we should have some ho fun workshops to include um, with the exhibit for uh, some hands-on activities for the children and families. Because you guys have run, actually run stop-motion events in the past, workshops for children to learn about the art of animation and, you know, practical stop-frame animation. Correct, and they were received very, very well. It was um, a big hit. And uh, this will be an even bigger and better um, way to, to showcase that programming. And uh, just really can't wait to get started with it. Well, what we always like to reflect back on is the fact that Ray watched King Kong in 1933, age 13. And that lit a fire inside him, which inspired him for the rest of his life. He realized what he wanted to do and yeah. how he wanted to express himself through this wonderful artwork and through his models. Um, it's obviously a lot easier now for somebody to 
see one of Ray's films and then run off and, and start making their own movies. It's a lot easier than it was in the 1930s. And that's what re we really hope this exhibition will do in helping to inspire new generations to understand animation and experiment and, and, and go and create their own dreams. Yes, exactly. And that's what um, we really try to, to do at the museum is just to create that little spark that can lead to something greater and bigger um, in someone's life or discovery. Um, that's all it takes, you know, um, just that little, that little bit of inspiration to lead someone to change the world. So, um, and that Ray changed the world just by watching that, that, that movie back when he was 13. So hopefully uh, we'll spark some interest in a lot of kids' minds. Now, before we finish up today, I have to ask, which is the model that you're most excited about seeing oh, in I knew, Oklahoma? I knew you were going to ask me that. Yeah. Uh, God, there's so many, but um, I have to say, like I said before, I'm going to go back to Clash of the Titans, um, the Medusa, uh, the Kraken, and uh, and Bubo. I really love Bubo. Um, but the Skeleton Warriors are pretty up top of my list, too. So, so pretty much everything. Yeah, pretty much everything. Well, I, the, I, I, yeah, the yeah. good thing is you're going to have, um, for some of these models, a couple of versions of them because of course Ray would have uh, different sizes of models for scale or he would have stand-in models, uh, models for close-ups so there's going to be a chance to see a couple of different boobos yes. and mm -hmm. prototypes of Medusa um, so you're really going to get to see the full lexicon of Ray's right. physical works. Yeah, very, very excited about that and you know the armatures are very um, interesting too, some of the ones that have been stripped down like the Pegasus armature and the Armature of the Cyclops from Seventh Voyage. Excellent. Well, Scott, uh, very much looking forward to this <coughs> exhibition and for giving people in Oklahoma and around the whole of the USA to a chance yeah. to see Ray's physical yeah, collection. We, we want every people to come from all over. Um, you know, we're centrally located, so it's pretty easy to get to us. And I know there's a lot of big fans out there. So hopefully, uh, we'll see you at Science Museum, Oklahoma. His name's Bubo. Do you understand all those clicks and wheezes? Perfectly clear to me. It's another gift from the gods. Like the sword in a helmet. So as you can hear, John, they're, they're very excited to have Ray Harryhausen's original models and artworks on display in Oklahoma. And the museum have a lot of very interesting ideas. So we hope that race fans from across North America and across the USA will get a chance to visit this. It, it runs from July 29th to December the 3rd. And they put together a really nice website as well, a Ray Harryhausen Mythical Menagerie. You can find that as part of the Oklahoma Science Museum website. It, it looks pretty spectacular, doesn't it? Yes, and uh, again, keep an eye, as always, on our social media, um, on our Facebook and Twitter, because... The museum have a lot of big ideas for this exhibition because it's important, because it's part of our Harryhausen 100 celebrations in the lead up to Ray Centenary in 2020. They wanted to do something extra special, so they're hoping to run some stop motion workshops for, for, for younger fans to, to go along and attend. And hopefully we'll have a couple of presentations from, from the foundation itself in, in the later months. So please go in and check it out. Check out the the original models from Jason and the Argonauts, the Sinbad films and Clash of the Titans. You can get in with uh, with the entry fee to the museum, so there's no extra charge for it, and you can spend all afternoon there just soaking up the Harryhausen magic. Now, I also didn't travel quite as far. I was at London's Barbican Centre for their Into the Unknown exhibition. Uh, I met somebody very special there this week, and uh, I kicked off by asking him what he thought of the exhibition. First Men in the Moon. The story of the first men to bridge the quarter million miles between heaven and earth. This is how it began. This is a solemn moment in the history of mankind. Terry, we just had a look at the exhibition here at the Barbican Centre, Into the Unknown. What did you think? Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. If anyone wants to come and see it, come and see it. It's, it's unbelievable, the amount of Picture, beautiful pictures, the models are fantastic. It's yeah, just great. So unlike most people coming along who are fans of Ray Harryhausen or science fiction, you have a particular link with Ray Harryhausen. Uh, tell our listeners, what's that link? Well, the link is that when I was ten, I played one of the Selenites in the first Men in the Moon at Shepparton Studios. Uh, fantastic. 
when I think back now, you know, as a 10-year-old, being in that film and seeing everything going on and uh, playing the cinema night, um, just unbelievable. And how, how, how did you play the cinema night then? Did they put you in a costume? How did that work? Well, we went for an audition. Um, we went down London and we uh, had to sort of win in the room and there was Ray Harryhausen in there and I believe Nathan Turner, we, we found. And we had to do a funny walk and we thought, well, what's going on? So we'd done the funny walk. Uh, our agent was Peggy O'Farrell. Um, she told us after that we got the parts. So we turned up and that's how we got the part. And when we arrived there, we went into these big like huts there outside and we got transformed into a selenite. And, um, they painted their faces with brown, brown leotards so make sure no skin showing or anything. Uh, the beehive went on, the arms, uh, the front bit, the back bit, the wings, and the, and the mask last. <laughs> so how long did all that take? I think that probably took about, when well, there was seven or eight of us, it must have taken over an hour or so, maybe hour and a half. Wow, each? Yeah. Gosh. Because we had to get there early in the morning. I remember getting, we got there very early in the morning. Uh, and when we were done, it was straight into the studio, like the massive studio and uh, we waited for us to about to begin so you were a child actor is that fair to say you you talk about having an agent so oh. you didn't just fall into this did you have well, no um peggy o'farrell was uh, she ran a stage school and an agent uh, and i joined back in 61 um, we'd done dancing and all different things like that and uh, we used to get us into different films you know uh, parts small parts um and so forth and from there that's how it built up um, we go for auditions, hopefully get them. If not, we didn't, obviously. Uh, and uh, there was quite a few films that uh, I ended up having small bits in and parts in and extra work and, and so forth. And meeting quite a few stars now, unfortunately, who are no longer with us, but great memories of them. So, Terry, for you it was just a job on another film, but dressing up obviously as an ant child because there were so many ant people on the moon it was felt that animating all of them just wasn't practical. So you sort of were a, um, a, an addition, if you like, to, to the creatures that Ray Harryhausen created. Did you get to meet Ray on set? Did you know what was happening with the creatures and the special effects? Yeah, we didn't actually, obviously, get to know him, uh, say, how are you, and we'll go away and have a chat. But um, Ray Harryhausen came and talked to us, and he explained to us exactly what he wanted and why. And obviously with the director there next with him, um, for instance, um, one scene, there was about eight or nine of us actually in, the whole, in that film. Um, and he would get us to stand on the right and move ourselves around. Then, he, then they would cut and then it move over to this side. And then we'd move and we'd move around. And Ray did say, when I'm finished with you, I'll have an army of selenites. Um, the stair, which uh, Lionel Jeffries climbed down the side, firing the gun. It was... It was the gun that killed the moon monster, moon monster. So um, it was interesting because we were actually told what we want to do. What we didn't know was, wow, what an explosion was going to happen when we saw the film with all the special effects. That's what we didn't know. And so you were chosen because of, obviously your build, because the Senonites were sort of childlike, weren't they? Yeah. And the slim build and so on. And so were all of the people who were chosen, the other boys, was it mostly boys or was it boys It was girls? all boys. So were you all kind of a similar build? So similar like, build. I mean, I was probably one of the smallest, being 10, uh, about 14 years of age, was probably the oldest. And we was all pretty similar build and so forth. Two of the boys were picked because they were acrobats, so they could... Do the, you know the rolling down the stairs and falling off that cliff when they get hit with Edward Judd with the helmet? That's um, they were picked for that uh, part of our team. In fact, one of the boys in that film was the Milky Bar kid, if you remember. Uh, Terry Brooks, he's wow. the Milky Bar kid Gosh. at the time. The Milky so, Bars are on me, uh, yeah, that's, that's right, on the moon as well. So, um, it, it was, um, but we had we had a lot of fun. Um, it was hard work sometimes because uh, if you've ever had to stand still when the um, holding, the, holding the side of the ship, spaceship, and then it goes dark, and the heat, and then it comes on. It was uh, it was quite interesting. 
So at the end of 1963, you would have shot this. How long would you have been in the studio for? Do you remember what month it was? Was it very well, cold? I, I, I can't personally remember, but I did talk to someone uh, after, and they reckon we were there six or seven weeks, so I, I can only go by that. And was it quite cold? Because sometimes, you know, these films get shot in wintertime. It, it, was, it was probably cold going from the changing to the actual main um, studio. But when you're inside, it was okay. That was fine. Um, and, and sometime we, we actually watched the filming going on, so it was quite interesting. Um, I remember when we first done the first scene, going up on that cliff, and there was a big explanation of what's going to happen with everybody, Ray, uh, Nathan, and that that the helmet's going to come round, and you're going to have to go and dive off backwards or fall off backwards, make it look like a fall off backwards to John and David who done that and uh, explaining now that what's going to happen is that we run across the bridge then after that cut come back and then take Lionel Jeffries uh, prisoner <laughs> so it was uh, well laid out and timed all had to be choreographed choreographed with money and so on. yeah now Nathan Duran who was the director on this directed a few other Ray Harryhausen films how did you get on with, with Nathan he was fine he was fine um, he spoke to us as normal. We didn't. Um, we, we listened to his, the instructions given. It's basically what it was. It's a job of you get instructions and you follow them, even whether you're ten or sixty-five. You have to, you follow them. And uh, if it wasn't done right, I must say with Ray, he'd make you do it again and again until it was done right. So we 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 never done all the, everything we done first time correct. There were slight changes also that Ray may have wanted, and Nathan wanted. So we had to stop and, and do it again. Now the film's producer Charles Schneer had quite a fearsome reputation, and he produced all of Ray Harryhausen's films, bar about two of them. How, how did you find working with Charles Schneer? I, I've got to be honest, I don't rem actually remember him there. He was probably there. That's a good thing. I think if but, you're not sure if the producer's no, there, no, it means things I, are going smoothly. Yeah, so. I, I'm not sure. I, I don't remember. I know there was three people, Ray, Nathan, and another gentleman, standing by, you know, where the cobwebs go over the selenite, the brains as we call them, um, and they were discussing um, scenes and sets. You couldn't actually understand everything they were saying, but we was waiting now to do our bit where the sun goes and we stand still. And then when the lights come back on, you move again. It's that round about that scene. Yeah, that sort of um, um, uh, uh, hibernation scene. Uh, he, he did come along once, um, uh, Mr. Nathan, and he said, "You've got to climb the sphere, and then you've got to poke your head in the sphere," which we've done. And then all of a sudden, I'm face to face with my fire with a shotgun. <laughs> I remember that bit. <laughs> Now, when we've seen the exhibition today, the fabulous thing is that the Ray Harryhausen collection, Ray kept most of the things he used for filming, and the other collection pieces we've seen there are from more recent films, because the tendency is to not hold on to things or to yeah. discard them and so on. Um, what we don't have in the foundation collection are any of these suits that the Selenites and no, children sure. or people wore. Um, what do you think happened to the suits? Well, I don't know. I mean, at the end of the film, we was told in clear terms to make sure the suits are handed back in, and which we did, and that was the last we we saw of them, obviously. So I don't really know what happened. Um, I find it rare that Ray used to like keeping all his models. So whether they were used on other films, or they're someone's somewhere. Because often costumes that are made bespoke for a film will then get sold to a costume house like Angels or Burmans, or Angel and Burmans as it then became known. Um, and then, of course, they get used, they get damaged, they get thrown away and so on. So I suspect those, those costumes would have been just hired out to whoever wanted them until they were of no longer of any no, use, no, which is a years. great shame. I'd love to have had a full-size Selenite to, to offer the Barbican to, yeah. to put on display. It, it's, I would have thought like, there, there were some that were not real, obviously. They were models in their cells, very big models, that I would have thought they would have survived, the actual models. And they were stuffed out with something to make them look like selenites. Well, the, the search goes on at the foundation. We're always looking. If anybody out there knows of anything connected with Terry, we talked earlier that there was a, a, a chaperone lady who took a photograph of all of the young people with their masks off. 
So if anybody has any information out there and would like to come forward, any photographs or any, 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 uh, any leads on where we might find a Selenite costume, then we are all ears. Terry, thank you very much. You're welcome. Soon others will be coming from Earth. Our galleries will be strewn with dead. I'm the only one who holds the secret of Cavrite. Then you and your secret will remain here on the moon. So there you go, Connor, the, the, the power of Facebook and Twitter for us to have, to have hooked up with one of the Selenite children this sort of 60 plus years later, um, or nearly 60 years later. It's, it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, I think this is just one of the lovely things about, about our Facebook presence and our Twitter presence. The people that get in touch with us about either their work with Ray or just the unexpected people who pop in and tell us how much they admired Ray's work. It's just fantastic. And who'd have thought that we would have had a Selenite appear on the podcast? It's, it's really wonderful. And uh, he's in good company because Ray very rarely used uh, men in suits or children in suits in this case. Uh, so there was the Selenites and then we had Peter Mayhew as Minotaur and then uh, Neil McCarthy as Calabos in Clash of the Titans. So Again, it's it's very rare that Ray would have actors in suits, but when he did, they were they were good ones. So it's it was fantastic to hear Terry's uh, reminiscences of of being a Selenite, and what a wonderful thing to to find. And again, if you're somebody who has a link to Ray Harryhausen, or you worked on one of his films, or you have a unique angle on on one of Ray's movies, then please get in touch with us because I think it's it's wonderful that we're uncovering so much about Ray's history that probably wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago or so but because everybody's so well connected now we're finding so many fascinating aspects of Ray's work that were previously unknown. Absolutely and a big thank you to Terry, his wife and his lovely daughter for coming along and uh, and sharing their experiences um, there at the Barbican Centre. Now um, not to give you an exhibition overload but also if you are in London or coming to London or, or live in London, um, the Tate Britain has a uh, a very interesting collection um, of Ray's art and creatures as part of the art of Ray Harryhausen. Now, those of you who remember from one of our first podcasts and when we started making videos for our Facebook and YouTube channel, you'll remember the um, restoration of Jupiter Pluvius, the, uh, the Joseph Gandhi painting that sat in Ray's lounge. For anybody who visited Ray's house, they will have remembered that spectacular painting. It's on long loan to the Tate. They've did a marvellous restoration which we filmed and now the Tates have asked um, for some specific pieces from the collection that show the crossover between the art that influenced Ray and how Ray was influenced by that art through, through John Martin, Gustave Doré and of course Joseph Gandhi and of course Ray's own artistry because he is, as far as we're concerned, one of the greatest artists of the 20th century um, and we have specific pieces um, on loan to them as well, don't we Connor? What can you tell me about that? That's right, and this is a very carefully curated exhibition. Uh, Martin Myrone, who is uh, who created the the exhibition, is somebody who knew Ray actually. Um, uh, Ray was a big fan of John Martin, and and uh, Martin Myrone is an expert on that kind of artwork. So they knew each other. I think they got to know each other around two thousand and ten, and this is something that Ray had discussed with with Martin about putting on an exhibition of his artwork at the Tate. So it's fantastic to see that up and running uh, so many years later. As I said, Martin Myron knows a lot about Ray Harryhausen and a lot about his films, and he had a very specific idea about the kind of artwork and the kind of models that he wanted to display. So obviously this exhibition could have had hundreds of images in it, but we've carefully selected the ones that link closest to the fine art that relates to Ray's work. So... We have, of course, Jupiter Pluvius with its columns and its fantastic panorama. That that painting is such a direct influence in a film like Clash of the Titans. So we have original artworks from Clash of the Titans showcasing the temples and the columns and the gods and all of these things that really Harryhausen trademarks. Um, and to see Ray's artwork and some of Ray's models and, of course, some of Ray's fantastic bronzes as well, on display at the Tate, surrounded by these huge, fantastic, fine pieces of 19th century art. I think it's something Ray would have loved to have seen, and that's something that uh, Vanessa Harryhausen, who's Ray's daughter, when she saw the pictures coming through of what the exhibition looked like, that was the first thing she said. She said, you know, her dad would have loved to have seen this. Um, I think it's going to be a very special exhibition, and it's one, again, where you can just immerse yourself in, in Ray's art and in the artwork that inspired Ray. It's a very unique chance to see both in the same place. 
and uh, again it's um it's in London so it's not it's not too far from the Barbican it's just a, a tube ride away you can really catch both you can you can find out about Ray's work in the context of the sci-fi genre at the Barbican and then head along to the Tate and find out a little bit more about what links Ray with the fine art and some some of the some of the greatest artists of the 19th century Excellent. Well, thanks for that, Connor. We'll, we'll finish off the episode now again, as we often do, with a, a piece of audio from Ray Harryhausen himself talking about his artwork. Thanks for joining us. And remember, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And do remember to vote for us at the Podcast Awards. Thanks very much. This will make a fine, heroic poem, you know. Or perhaps a play. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I won't leave you out. <laughs> I have a big collection of John Martin engravings. Uh, They uh, are very impressive because they have a theatrical quality to them. He portrayed all these rather sublime, dramatic uh, images, and uh, they left an impression on me, and it's very difficult to pinpoint it. These things come to you subconsciously if you do a lot of research in your early period of of learning the trade. (laughs) I think... He influenced many artists of later periods, like Gustave Doré. I always say he's the for one of the first art directors of motion pictures because uh, so many of the early art directors would uh, use his compositions. He had a wonderful way of making a depth. He would have the foreground very dark and a medium ground and then a very light background. His engravings were very filmic. All these painters of of that period were visionaries. And I think uh, his paintings were highly influential in early films like uh, The Deluge and uh, various other films of that period. So all these artists, they influence other people and it gradually grows. It's a snowball and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Copyright in the Ray Harryhausen podcast is owned by the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation a registered Scottish charity, number SC001419, 2017. This recording may not be reproduced in whole or in part without the written permission of the Foundation. The views expressed within these podcasts do not necessarily reflect those of the Foundation, its trustees or employees. For further terms and conditions, please contact us at rayharryhausen.com, where you can also find our Facebook and Twitter links.